Hey guys, Matt Kuhn here, uh, co-host of FTR with Dax. Jay Briscoe, of course, has passed away. He passed away as we, as I record this now, yesterday. It's so sad and so tragic, but we don't feel the time is right to do a show or a segment or whatever it is that, that is done in these situations. Um, so we're just going to let the show run as is, and we hope you understand, of course, just all the best to the Briscoe family and friends and you out there, if you're suffering and, and you're mourning and it's just such a tragic situation, uh, just know we're just going to try to give you a couple hours of a fun show and just take your mind off things as we always try to do every week. Um, Dax did want to say something and, um, I have a statement from him and of course we're going to talk about this more later. But uh, this is Dax's statement on Jay Briscoe. Having a show based around or having a segment of the show dedicated to Jay doesn't feel right today. My ever-changing emotions wouldn't allow me to properly say goodbye or pay the ultimate tribute to him. Jay absolutely deserves me at my best. He always gave me his best. Right now I feel so empty. I just stare off in the distance and catch myself shaking my head not being allowed to wrap my mind around this whole situation. Next week, I'll do my best to be 100% for all of you, but more importantly, for Jay, Mark, and their whole family. I understand that without Jay and Mark, my 2022 wouldn't have been a fraction as successful as it was. With that success, I'll be able to take care of my family for years to come. Life should always be more real than wrestling. Jay reminded me of that. A lot of guys should keep that in mind today. Thank you, Jay, for everything. I love you. Wrestling friends, I'm Matt Coon, and that means you're listening to FTR with Dax Harwood, your former world 24-7 champion, mm. Dax Harwood. How's remind it going, me. Dax? Man, don't remind <laughs> me of that. I've uh, I've tried to forget that. I've tried to erase that from our whole legacy, man. I don't ever want to think about that championship in my life. Well, that's a, that, that would make it eight stars, not nah. seven stars. <laughs> seven stars is much better. <laughs> Seven stars is much better. Alliteration. Alliteration is good. <laughs> well, it's another week here at FTR with Dax Harwood. The first three episodes really well received. You're still hearing a lot of good feedback from your peers and the fans, Dax? Yeah, man. Uh, a lot of a lot of good uh, feedback. Texts from friends and fans and, uh, you know, people in the business. And um, just more than anything this week, I think it's the uh, a lot of people congratulating me on the success of the podcast which is still mind-blowing to me i can't believe people tune in and download and and want to listen to things i have to say but as long as they want to listen i'll guess i'll uh, keep running this uh shitty ass mouth i think i've kind of figured out what people one of the reactions to this show in that a lot of people are like well dex says all this stuff and then you'll see someone tweet actually he doesn't say anything bad about anybody oh yeah yeah so Fan, th- fans, friends, uh, colleagues, work colleagues, they it's it's it blows my mind, dude. Like I had a conversation with one of my work colleagues today, or excuse me, not today, about three days ago, um, because I had heard some issues they may have had and expressed in the locker room. And uh I called them and I said, Look, hey, uh you apparently have an issue with me. I have a lot of the boys telling me about it. Like, uh, if you have an issue with me, man, all you got to do is call me. That's it. You know, like you don't have to run to the office. You don't have to run to the boys. You don't have to run to Meltzer. All you got to do is tell me, man, and we can uh, figure it out or we can completely disagree and not figure it out, but at least you came to me, you know, but, um, more often than not, the fans are enjoying it, which is the only reason that we do it. Um, my colleagues are enjoying it, uh, you know, and friends from the past, friends, current friends, they're enjoying it as well. And uh, it just it just feels good that there are people that want me to succeed 
in this, uh, especially in a world of social media where uh, it's easy to say, I uh, hope you fail or you suck right, or whatever, right. or you have a shitty ass body or whatever. Well, I was going to say, I think what I figured out is because people seem so conflicted and inconsistent about what you say. I don't think it's what you say. It's the subjects you talk about are things that aren't supposed to be talked about. Right. And I also think that, you know, in a world where people nowadays hate to hear the truth, man, and, and they, they hate, they hate conflict. I think, I think, uh, you know, in 2023, people don't like conflict. I think they love to hide behind, uh, the apparition of the the tough guy mentality or tough guy mentality that social media brings to them. So they're allowed to do that or, or not even social media text messaging as well, you know, brings to them and allows them to think that they're this, they can stick their chest out and they're this tough guy or girl. Um, But then when, you know, reality sets in and we're allowed to talk face to face, uh, I, I think that when it comes right down to it, someone who tells the truth because I haven't said anything bad about anybody. I haven't, I haven't uh, spilled any tea about anybody. All I've done is tell the truth and, 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 and made sure that I said it was my version of the truth. And I don't think that sets well with a lot of people in today's age because I think we all have to toe this line of being uh, on everyone's good side. And uh, I feel like if, and this is how I've always been, and I think this is my uh, biggest downfall maybe is that if I pretend to be on your good side, if I pretend to toe that line, um, then I'm being, uh, fake to myself. And then I think, you know, in the back of my head, if I'm being fake to myself, I gotta go home and face my daughter and my wife and I'm a fake human being to them too. And you know, it's all a spiral from there, but, uh, I'm going to be real to you. And I would hope that everyone would be real to me as well. Well, Having said that, we have a packed show today. We're going to talk about FTRKO. We're going to have a tequila of the week. And we're also going to have a non-wrestling question of the week. We're going to start doing that every week over on our Twitter at FTR with Dax. And we also have a match of the week. But FTRKO is where we're going to get started. Of course, one of the longest longest tenured factions of all time right dex <laughs> dude uh yeah um it was it was hot for a very long time four horsemen-esque uh, if you look back at that time period <laughs> for about a for, i don't know for about an eight month time period me and cash were jumping from faction to faction to faction to faction so we were uh the de facto faction you guys were like a uh modern day booty man you know you were zodiac <laughs> and you were all these different things all the time but seriously this ftrko thing we're gonna get started with right now on ftr with dax ftrko we say it like it's a thing because you guys really seem to try to make it a thing but it started maybe a couple of days before that we had SummerSlam 2019 and there was no revival to be found a matter of fact there was only one tag team match, the women's championship, Alexa and Nikki versus the Iconics. Does that say something about, to you guys at the time, does it say something about where you thought you were in the company or where tag team wrestling was in the company? Uh, I think both. Uh, I would like to think both. I mean, you know, it's no secret that we had already, you know, in, uh, man, February of that year, um, we had already asked for our release and we had not been granted that release um, because we knew, you know, that if we stuck around WWE, uh, that we would never reach the heights that we wanted to, or we would never get the opportunity to reach the heights that we wanted to. Uh, obviously, we had uh, a lot of um, belief in ourselves, you know, and a, and a, and a lot of uh, belief in our abilities. But if you're not given the opportunity to show those abilities, then we would have just been stuck at a certain position. And, you know, it would have been easy. And I heard it online all the time, especially after the news got out that we, um, we asked for a release, but I heard it online all the time. Just collect your money. I wish I was making the money you were, or I wish I was in the position you were. Um, but that's just not how I'm wired, man. Uh, I, you know, and also let me say about the money. Um, it wasn't as much money as you guys would imagine. 
uh, especially considering the tax write-offs we had to make sure we got like me and cash, you know, at, at the time I was 30, what I was 34, you know, and he was 31. Right. Uh, and we were rooming with each other and traveling with each other, splitting cars, splitting meals, splitting rooms, because we didn't have enough money, you know, uh, or not, not that we didn't have enough money, but we were trying to save money. You know, um, so it wasn't right. Like you're we not were... trying to watch this paycheck just kind of whittle away to nothing as you spend money on travel, rental cars. Not to mention, you guys uh, spend some money on gear once in a while too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of gear. It's uh, hanging up in my closet now and uh, occupies a lot of space in there. My wife's not too happy about that, but uh, you know, that that's the thing. Like, you know, uh, we had to 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 make sure that we were putting back a little bit of money to, because if you look back at 2019, uh, I was number one, Baron and cash were tied for uh, number two, as far as most matches in 2019 for WWE. And wow. so we were on the road every single week, four days a week, five days a week. Um, you know, it, it, and so when you think, I've signed this million dollar contract or whatever. It's not that, uh, it's not that lucrative. Uh, our contracts were the very bottom dollar. I mean, I'll tell you mine. I don't know about cashes, but our, our first contract for the main roster was 125, 150, 175 across the three years. And that was it, you know? Wow. And yeah. So 125. Yeah. And that, that doesn't include any expenses at all. No, no, no. It's, obviously we're allowed. We, we could, we could, there's the potential of making more than that and, and, and breaking that, that uh, 125 barrier and that 125 ceiling uh, with merch and pay-per-views and stuff like that and in-house shows as well. But that was our, that was what we had signed. And it do, that is a lot of money. That's a lot of money to right. me right now, right. but you got to think about it. If I'm on the road five days a week, right. And I'm spending breakfast, lunch, and dinner all five days a week. Let's not even talk about snacks or whatever. Uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, five days a week on the road while my wife is at home cooking and paying for groceries for her and my daughter. Um, and then I'm paying for rental cars. And then I'm paying for hotels. Uh, you know, I'm not making as much money as you think. Um, but, but you know, so so when, when I hear a lot of the fans, especially then, when I heard a lot of the fans say, they could have just sat back and had catering and made their money. It's not that simple, man. Uh, money is one thing, but there's always been something that I've wanted to do for professional wrestling and being there at that time was not going to allow me to do that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how you felt about SummerSlam, but first the Dax Harwood tequila of the week. Oh. Are you ready to do that? <laughs> <laughs> am, am, I, what, am I breathing? Yeah, brother. Yes. What time is it? Seven sixteen. I've been waiting all day for you. And we have a special, uh, special thing here because a friend bought me a bottle of tequila, and it got it, it. It came to me, and it looks more like a urn. I'm not sure what I'm looking at right here. What kind of tequila is this? I have in my hand. Which well, also funny is enough, the tequila of the week. Funny enough, just like an urn, it brings me back to life too when I'm down. Uh, I get down in life and I raise the urn and I get up, you know, uh, get up in more of the ways than one, if you know what I'm talking about. That'll be our blue chew ad later. Uh, this is our Classe Azul Reposado. Um, it is my second favorite tequila that I have. And I know there's some tequila snobs that say, oh, there's additives to it. And yes, there is, but additives isn't such a bad thing. It's not such a terrible thing. Um, but you know, the, how smooth this tequila is and uh, the, the, the taste of it. And obviously the handcrafted bottle is a, a handcrafted bottle and, and um, that allows and preserves the flavors and the, the agave that's in it. Um, I don't know. It's it, some people, like I said, the snobs give it a bad rep. Me, on the other hand, I love it. Uh, it is about 180 to 200 dollars a bottle. But uh, if you're uh, if you're a little uh, light handed on the poor, you'll be able to make it through. Me, I'm a moderate poor kind of guy, so <laughs> it doesn't last that long. And we're gonna have t-shirts soon. I think one of them is gonna be a moderate poor t-shirt. Uh, let me show you the glass I'm using today. Oh. Uh, I just use this for the occasion. This is a new day glass, sir. Oh. A new day glass oh, to celebrate uh, what we're talking about today. Makes me love you and hate you both at the same time, dude. <laughs> My glass, standard hardwood glass here. There we go. So you ready? 
So well, let me let me ask you: Is this your first time ever tasting Class A? I know this you're looks- not a I know you're not a huge tequila guy. No, I've never tasted uh, Class A before. I've seen the okay. bottle before, but I've never tasted it before. So when you, fin- it. when you finish this, and hopefully you don't finish it tonight, or maybe hopefully you do, uh, it's a great vase. Uh, it's a great centerpiece. Um, I like to keep it around. Plus, it makes me look rich when people come over. I keep them all. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I can't wait to see what you think. You got to give me your honest review, though, okay? Oh, for sure. All right, so Dax is pouring as well. I already poured mine. And and, uh, and and we're gonna sip on it through the episode, right? Absolutely, it's gonna be the okay. best episode of all time. Uh, yes. Let's let's cheers virtually here. Virtual cheers, virtual cheers, and a virtual bell ring. Okay, to all of you at home. Wow, that is some fucking good tequilas, <laughs> Dex Harwood. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so there's some caramel flavoring to it, which I love. There's a little bit of vanilla as well. Um, you know, and this one, again, is Reposado, and it's aged in uh, the whiskey oak barrels um, for between three months and about 12 months. Um, it's, I don't know, it's whenever I want to celebrate something, whatever it is, um, and I'm around a lot of friends, this is what I choose. Um, it's such an easy sipper. Never, ever, ever, ever mix it in your margaritas, or I'll have to fucking kill you uh and i'd hate to do that uh it's just a sipper uh no ice either but if you if you have to choose ice go for it that's fine i won't kill you for that but uh, i'm glad you enjoy it what do you uh what do you taste wow it, i taste the sweet it's sweet and it's smooth it's not like it's not like a tequila you normally get that you have to ah, i'm kind of like work down it just it just goes down it's smooth it's it's got, you can taste the citrusy, you can taste the agave, you can taste the, I guess it's caramel. It's sweet and it's smooth. And I just took another sip without even thinking about it just now. Yeah. And that, that's, the, that's the scary part about it because you can, uh, <laughs> you can mess yourself up on it. I'm glad but, I have notes. I'm yeah. Have notes. <laughs> yeah. But dude, it's, it's, you know, a lot of tequilas are, well, I don't want to say a lot. A lot of the tequilas that are, uh, widely manufactured that a lot of the people use do have a bite to them. They do have a kick to them and it turns people off, but it is a, it is, a, but the agave and the tequila does, um, there are studies done where the agave, uh, what is it? Brings the, uh, uh, the body's temperature up, raises the body's temperature a little bit, which, which makes people more alert, but also, you know, you hear some people say that that make tequila makes me mean. Um, that's, kind of where it comes from but just because it gets your raises your body temperature up which could also in turn make you more uncomfortable which turns you into being mean but for me it raises my body temperature up allows me to be more alert and la- and for some reason um i enjoy the feeling and i love hugging people and uh, i love telling them how much i love them while i'm drinking tequila which y- we you had some at um wrestle Cade, right we we drank tequila and, and it was so crowded. We were uncomfortably close, but it was kind of cool because I just started asking you a question and we were literally just started doing a podcast right there. It was really yeah. cool. <laughs> Dude, I don't even want to know how much I spent at that bar that night on Dude. people. I was just... <laughs> You uh, bought everybody. I had a everybody great, you could see. Yeah. Dude, I had a, such a great match with uh, Speedball Mike Bailey. I wish everyone could have saw that match. And I mean, you can on Fight TV, uh, but what a great match that was. And so I was, I was on a wrestling high, and then I had a couple of my friends with me, and I knew you and I were going to start this podcast, and you were there. And what it's just such a great night, dude. I, um, you know, it was it, so it, fun. I got to hang out with, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, Sherilyn, and uh, yep, you know. Alba and people like that, but you got to meet with your friends. Wrestlecade's always a blast, and uh, I'm probably going to go again. I love going to Wrestlecade. Yeah, I think so too. And I think I did last time uh, introduce you to my best buds, the Dawson brothers, dude. And I've watched your, I've watched your boy Zane wrestle every uh, year at Wrestlecade. My son and I have literally had conversations about him. So it's is, very cool to meet him. You know, in my opinion, if you're talking about a monster heel, he is the best unsigned talent in the world, and his twin brother is just as incredible as he is too. He could have been brought in as a uh, Wyatt at one point. You know, oh, yeah, for sure. He's really great. Check out the Dawson brothers uh, wrestling all around the country and really one of the great young tag teams, monster heel tag teams in the world. Well, I guess this is a wrestling podcast. And uh, let's get to that question. I, I asked you before, but we talked a little background on pay and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You asked for your release, you said, and now we're at SummerSlam. You're not on the biggest show of the year. When you're, Are you just... Because obviously they don't think about tag team wrestling much. If there's no men's tag team match on the whole card, 
Um, are you thinking we're we're just going to ride this out? We're we're about done here. Uh, you, you mean when we asked for a release, or no? I mean uh, by the time SummerSlam came around. Uh, by the time, yeah. Well, um, all right. Little inside baseball here, and I hope this doesn't get me any heat. But this is what this podcast is for. It gets me heat all the time. Uh, so we had asked for a release initially. Uh, we were told, um, are you sure you want to do this? Because there's a big quote unquote wind of change coming and we would love for you to be a part of it. And, uh, we said respectfully, we would love to have our release. We need to go out. We need to make a name for ourselves, and hopefully come back and make more money, but also increase our, um, uh, marketability for you. And he said, okay, well, I'll have, um, I'll have Mark Carano contact you tomorrow and we'll start the process. Right. And this was again, earlier in the year, not, not SummerSlam, but we'll get there. Um, and so Mark Carano called and some things led to other things. And we talked to Hunter and he said in six months, he said, I'm not, we, we can't let you go right now, but in six months, if you're not happy with the position you're in, in our company, then we can revisit the conversation. And we said, okay, thank you. And obviously we respected Hunter and had a lot of faith in him. He had entrusted him anyway. So we, we had no reason to, to not doubt him. Come around SummerSlam time, uh, we were pretty sure we weren't going to be figured in. Um, but we had done all we could to get a release. But also, you know, it, like I said, in 2019, we had – the most matches out of any wrestler in the company, us, us two and Baron Corbin. Uh, and we prided ourselves, the three of us prided ourselves on being the workhorses of the company. Maybe now that I think about it, maybe it was a uh, rib on us because we kept working our ass off every live event because we wanted to show them what they would lose come 2020 uh, because both of our contracts were supposed to be up in April of 2020, which we'll get there. I'm sure in another episode. Um, but uh, you know, we were working our ass off in these live events, never taking a back seat, um, always pushing the pedal forward because we wanted to make sure that one, we could either get the opportunity to show all this, what we were doing on these house shows to a couple of thousand of people to, to show it to millions of people across the world on national television. And two, that, uh, we wanted to show them if we leave, this is what you guys are letting go. Three, we wanted to say if they wanted to keep us, we had a number in mind that would have made us happy because if we were going to put up with the bullshit um, of WWE at the time, not right now, at the time, at least we would have to get paid so I could take care of my family. In the back of my mind, I could say, okay, I'm not creatively satisfied, but monetarily I'm satisfied and I know that my wife and my daughter are finally getting taken care of. The night after SummerSlam was Raw, uh, the August um, 12th, 2019, you have a match with Dorado and Grand Metallic ending in a no contest in a minute 30 because all the 24-7 guys ran in. Now, as you guys oh, that take tag team kind of seriously, you know, you get on Raw, you're off SummerSlam, and then you're told 24-7 time, not to mention that you guys end up pinning uh, oh, you've been Truth. Oh, okay. And you ended up with ah. a unified, short-lived, unified 24-7 reign, hence the eight star. Uh, what did you think about that? Yeah, obviously, uh, wasn't too happy. Um, and I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, big surprise, you're not happy. No, I, you know, there was a lot of things we still wanted to accomplish as a tag team. I mean, in 2023, there are a lot of things we still want to accomplish as a tag team. But being co-24-7 champions – was not on our bucket list of things to do. So uh, that, that obviously championship was taken as a joke. Um, it was some uh, comic relief of a two hour television show. And uh, you know, I, I would have much rather not had it. Uh, I don't want that on my resume. I don't even want to bring it up. I, I you know, I should have told you off there not to bring it up, but right. you know, here we are, but well, here we are. And, even as a fan, okay, like let's say I see Zack Ryder, Kurt Hawkins, two guys I like, yeah, and all of a sudden I see them running around the ring for that twenty four seven title. I'm thinking, oh shit, right? Like, yeah, I don't think the perception. A, I don't know if a wrestler you had that same perception as a fan. It, it, I think it defined almost everybody down except our truth and Drake Maverick. 
Absolutely. It, it, the, the perception of being a, a background character, you know, uh, you know, you watch these great movies and they're in, you know, let's just say the two main characters are in a bar or in a restaurant and you see a couple off in the distance and they're sitting there and they're eating and pretending to talk. That was what we were, you know, and that's not what I wanted to. I, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that I wanted to be the main event or that I wanted to be the, the, uh, guy with the most, the most segments on the television show, you know, I just wanted, uh, the revival to be respected because of our abilities, what we could bring to the table. I wanted to get the opportunity to do that. And, uh, Vince just wasn't a fan of myself and cash, which is fine. Uh, he wasn't a fan of tag team wrestling, which is fine, but that's not fine for us. You understand that that's not, that's not fine for if, if, if I wanted to go to a job where I'm not creatively fulfilled, I would stay home and work at Starbucks and I'd be happy. You know, I'd be happy because one, I'd have great benefits that I could give to my wife and daughter where I wouldn't have to pay for my own insurance, where it was coming out of my pocket, where I wasn't being able to, to, to provide for them because I was scared that I wasn't going to make a bill every week. Yeah, I forgot but, about insurance. Yeah. Right, exactly. right. Right. But I could work at Starbucks and, and see my family every single day and, and make coffee and, and be happy. If I'm working for a boss who isn't a fan of what I do, or even the 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 position that uh, that me and my partner are allowed to be in, you know what I mean? Like, why would we want to be there? You know, it, again, it's easy to say, "Well, right. I want to be there for the for the paycheck every two right. weeks." Yeah, I understand. Or I'm just glad to be a part of the big show. But but I am, you know, I've told you on every episode. I am infatuated with my, with my wife. I am in love with my wife, but what just happens if one week I bring home that bitterness from the road home and I bring it home to her. Right. And then I apologize before it's time for me to leave because I'm home for a day and a half and then I leave. Right. And then I go, go on the road and then I'm bitter again. And then I bring it back home that very next week for a day and a half. But right before I leave, I say, I'm sorry, babe. I'm sorry that I was, I was, I was acting out because of my job. And then I keep doing that every single week. And then we divorce and then I have nothing because she's my everything. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that's, that's what it all comes down to. It's not just about your paycheck. It's about your life and what you hold dear to your life. And I hold her and my daughter dear to my life. And if that was making me unhappy, and if I was bringing it home and making life more miserable for them, then I wasn't doing my job as a father and a husband. Well said. Some things just aren't worth sacrificing. No, not at all. Uh, one dot one dollar is not worth my happiness with my family. Well, luckily for you, your twenty four seven championship was very short lived. As <laughs> yeah. you got it back quickly, yeah. but shortly thereafter, you start working with Randy Orton. Before we talk about Randy, you're an old school wrestling fan. Bob Orton Jr. has to be some on your radar. What do you think oh, of him? He was even at the time, like the code words kind of came through that he was a good worker. Like they used the term technical wrestler back then. Dude, he was the base, right, for, for who he was working with. He was the base for the match. He was the foundation for the match. Um, he was the reason that the, he would put himself here and put the excitement around himself like that. And that's what a true heel does. And that's what a real heel does, an unselfish, true, real heel. They put themselves in the middle, and they bring the excitement around them. And the excitement around them is that baby face. And you take the baby face, and you accentuate his positives, and the negatives that he might have, you take them away. And, and, and that's what a lot of – a lot of the heels, they, they get lost with that now. And they forget about that because they think to themselves, oh, I got to get myself over. I got to make sure I get this move in, this spot in, this facial expression in. But that's not the case, man. We're here at, well, not me because I'm a baby face now. Here we go. Uh, but as heels, your job is to make this baby face. So he could, like I said last week, so he can draw the houses. He can draw the ratings. He can draw the buy rates for the pay-per-views so he can all make money because that's who the people are paying to see. They're not paying to see the antagonist, right? You go to see Superman movie, you pay to see Superman. You go to see Batman, you see Batman. You don't pay to see Joker, you know, even though Joker has become his own, uh, you know, his right. own kind of baby face. But, but you, you pay to see those uh, protagonists and Arn told me he said my favorite tag team growing up was Dick Slater 
and Bob Orton. And he said, I didn't know why for a long time. And then he re- and he said, I, then I realized that those two were taking the babyface team they were working with and they were creating the excitement around them. They were making sure that the, that, that the baby faces were bumping them around and making them, and they were making their baby faces look like they were world beaters. And that's what Bob was good at, man. If you can look up a match with him, there's a match with him and Tito Santana. I think it's from War to Settle the Score in about 1984, 85-ish. I can't remember the exact year, uh, but that match is so incredible. And then there's a match with him and Ricky Steamboat. So beautiful, man, because those two talents, those two baby faces, two of the greatest baby faces of all time, Absolutely. obviously, yeah. uh, two of the greatest, greatest baby faces of all time, he makes them even better if you can. And... Bob, man, uh, I, I've actually worked a match with Bob. I've had a match wow. with Bob. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Me and I talked about him a few weeks ago. Best baby face of all time. Nobody knows about Charlie Dreamer against George South and Bob Orton Jr. And uh, in Clayton, North Carolina. And uh, he was still so good. This was about 2010. Still so good, man. Like his punches were on time. Uh, his, his, timing was on time and that's what a good heel is that that uh oh, man god man like knowing when to bring the fans down and then turn it on a dime and start bumping around like crazy for that baby face he is the he, he's just incredible i still send uh randy i still send randy um youtube lip youtube links of his dad to show him how good he was as a kid, I remember, you know, of course, that superplex, mm-hmm. which was this just crazy finishing move off the second rope. And also, you know, being factored into the main event of WrestleMania 1, he obviously was a very big part of WWE. Big star. Also, suffered the world's worst arm injuries. That's a thing. Like, oh, another thing. Like, one week, we're getting uh, piled driven through a flaming table, and the next right. week, we're okay. Oh man, come on, dude. Like, whew, even though it really did hurt, I worked this ass injury for, for a good month, you know, and, and, and Bob did the same thing with his arm. Like it's, um, I don't know. It's, it's a lost start and being a great heel. And if you, if you're a heel and you want to differentiate, differentiate yourself from everyone else today, who's working, watch Bob Armstrong, watch him because what he would do this, he, I've talked about this with Tully and with uh, uh, Fit Finley and Dennis Condry, but there's so much power in this and him, him putting on the brakes. This is so much power. And then when that baby face either slips on a banana peel or he, he shits that baby face out of a spot or something, and then he's an aggressor. And then he shows why he is a great wrestler and why he is a badass. But then that baby face makes the comeback. And then he starts bumping around and selling like a heel should, because there's a difference between selling like a heel and selling like a baby face. The baby face crumbles and begs for sympathy. The heel takes flat back bumps and gets right back up and is on his heel and falling backwards and taking ass bumps and things like that. And his eyes are wide and his mouth is gaped open and he's using his hands to beg off. Like, my God, man, he was fucking beautiful, dude. Randy Orton. Randy Orton uh, is a big, big star in WWE by the time you get there. Uh, When was the first time you met him? And also, as we talked about off air, Every wrestler says, man, this guy's the best. I read a quote that a few of you were standing around the curtain and Daniel Bryan was like, Randy's the best, right? Like, you know, what is it about him that makes him so great? That's, yeah, like, I can't, uh, no one can describe it. I mean, we could, but the average fan and even some of the wrestlers wouldn't understand it his timing is impeccable he's in the right spot his 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 selling is so beautiful like uh he knows when to make his selling um uh, like when he when we when it's time to make his selling serious and he knows when to make it uh an, an entertaining ass kicking if that makes any sense um he's athletic uh he takes his time he's precise uh, every kick, every punch, every movement, you know, you always hear it's so cliche now because so many people have said it, but no wasted motion. That's him. 
That's Randy. And that's what he taught me more than anything is no wasted motion, how to take your time, when to slow down, when to accelerate, when to bring the people up, when to bring them back down, when to, if, if they're down, let them stay down because it's your job as a professional to make sure they go on the ride with you. You don't go on the ride with them. And that's kind of what Randy does. He's the orchestrator. He's the maestro. He is fucking good. And there's a reason why so many of us say he is the best in the world, or maybe even the best in ring of all time. Um, Yes, he doesn't do a million moves and he doesn't have the most articulate move set. You know what I mean? But man, does he know how to control a crowd? That's what makes a great wrestler. That's what makes a great wrestler and a great entertainer and a great storyteller. Controlling the crowd and making you feel something you didn't think you could feel or you didn't think you could feel at the time. You know, if you're in such a great mood, if you've just asked your wife to marry you and she said yes, and you guys decided to go to a WWE event to celebrate, but then Randy's in the ring and he makes you mad for that one second, even on the happiest day of your life, he can do that. And that means he's the maestro with the fucking baton. And that's why he's so great, dude. The maestro with the fucking baton. (laughs) Indeed he is. Indeed, you guys... Your fate had changed in one night. The next night, there's a SmackDown uh, taping. And the first thing you do, you come out with a promo against the New Day saying that they've ruined the tag team division. Not only that, you have a match with the uh, champions, the New Day. Uh, But by the time everything comes around at the end, there's a little feud going on with Randy Orton and Kofi. It all gets mashed up. You have a six-man. And um, it really... uh, was the beginning of FTRKO. Uh, mm-hmm. When did you first know of your pairing with Randy, and when did you first meet him and get to know him at all? Um, so I, I first met him. I you know I, I mean I'm sure I met him a few times in WWE and said hello or whatever. But this is our first time actually uh, conversing with him and and you know talking to him and picking his brain and him picking our brains actually. And um, ar- around this time was 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 it. Um, There was never any, you know, and we can get into it, uh, uh, you know, we can get into it deeper later, but there was never any plans for FTRKO. It was never, there were never any plans for it to be something, to be this. But I remember after it happened, Randy said, there's something here, right? And then we did some house shows and he said, I can feel it. Like, this is the most excited I've been in my career in a very long time. And I want to keep it going. Um, And, you know, we, we started doing some live events and stuff, and he saw that me and Dan didn't like to call a lot of things in the back. And so we had this match when I, it may have been a SmackDown match, actually. And I don't know. He kind of does, right? Like we'll call, he's known for being meticulous about his promos, at least, and being careful about, you know, you hear the story about the Seth Rollins uh, RKO, about him being a little cautious about that. He's, he's kind of a, a, a planned type person, is he not? No. Uh, well, okay. So this may be going a little bit too much into the future, but we had this, we had this match with, um, with the new day, a six man tag. And like I said, we didn't call a very, we didn't call a lot of things. And I think it was a dark match. Maybe there was a dark match. I think we might've had with, uh, Roman and the Usos or something. I can't remember. Anyway, we didn't call it a lot of things. We called it a lot of it in the ring and we got to the back and he was just, you know, he was astounded at how much we talked in the ring. He said, do you guys do that all the time? And I said, yeah, that's kind of our, you know, we don't, we don't like to call a lot of things in the back. And he said, that's how it used to be. He said, when I was coming up with Hunter and with Sean and with flair and he, you know, started naming all these people and Adam edge, he was like, we felt it and we called it in the ring. And he said, and then somewhere, you know, in the mix, he said, it changed. And a lot of guys started calling it in the back. Um, and I, I think it was because a lot of guys of that old regime, like Hunter and Sean and Flair and Edge, they all kind of left at one time, you know, and it left uh, it left all these younger guys to do what they knew and what they knew was to call it and back because of t- television wrestling. And he was so shocked by how much we called in the ring. And so like he he admired us so much. And that was the day that he said, there's something here. Like, this is something that I want to do. And, uh, man, he, he, he fought for it. In this match, you guys win, you guys beat the new day setting up 
a program with the New Day for the tag team titles. But you also just beat the hell out of the New Day. Uh, in doing so, you gave him a move like a flapjack into an RKO, a shatter, a shatter RKO. Super uh, RKO. Super RKO. There we go. Who, who came up with that? So we were trying to think of what we could do. And, uh, you know, I can't remember exactly who it was, but I remember thinking like, man, we, we, cash does the lift off or excuse me i do the lift off and cash does the knees obviously randy does the rko obviously there have been the 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 3d there's been the 3d um and i thought there was an opportunity because i think it was xavier woods that took the first one and he was running and we had the camera zoomed in with him and cash and i slid in from either side of the ring right out of nowhere because that was randy's biggest thing the rko out of nowhere and we hoisted him up in the air and randy called him with the rko boom and it was the super rko um so uh you know i, I would like to take credit for it but i'm not 100 percent sure well it certainly looked great um you know it's a smackdown marred with with tragedy, as uh, I don't know how this affected you, but someone was trying to murder Roman Reigns. Um, <laughs> and uh, did was it concerning to you uh, having to walk behind the stage, not have a bunch of stuff fall on you, or get in your car and have another car smash into you? Um, how much were you paying attention to the to the other stuff going on the show at the time, such as that? Not at all, I guess, because I don't remember it until you just said it right now. Not one bit. <laughs> I forgot it too, but I think that's called repression. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tequila I do that out, every day. Yeah. Tequila does bring out mean Matt. I will tell you yeah, that. Here's to the new day again. Hold on one second. To my boys. I think while you're drinking real quick, dude, sure, they're sure. so incredible. They're so underrated. Even if they are rated high, they're so underrated. Um, and and I, I mean that as uh, professionals and I mean that as entertainers, but – more than that, as human beings, man, there was no other person besides those four guys, Randy and, and New Day, who looked out for me and Dan more. They they wanted to make sure they wanted to make they wanted us, us to succeed more than anybody in the company. And uh, I'll never, ever, ever forget that. It's interesting. Your journey in WWE is the revival trying to catch your footing. These are three guys who by all accounts and all observations are three of the most brilliant people in the organization, but yet they had to bind together to kind of survive. They're almost less than some of their parts because they're so good, but they kind of had to do that to survive. How That's a great example for other wrestlers. Isn't right, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Working with a chip on your shoulder, you know, and always wanting to prove yourself. And that's not, always, not, not, that's not always the best way to go because that's why I get in trouble a lot of times because I always feel like I have a chip on my shoulder and I have to have a chip on my shoulder because it makes me work better. But also, too, I feel like uh, if I'm not working, like the whole world is against me, that I'm not working to my full uh, capacity. But those guys, man, you know, I, I can't explain it enough that, you know, they were brought in for this one particular position. And I don't think that there was a lot of faith in what they were doing. And they were set out to show, watch us, and we'll make sure that we're the biggest part of your company. We're the most over part of your company. And they did, man. They became the biggest heels at one point or another. You remember, if you, if you can remember, they were the biggest heels at I one do. point. And then they became the biggest baby faces in the company. And uh, there's not a lot of people who can say that they've done that. They had an organic heel turn because the fans turn on them. Right. Yeah. And, and then they leaned into it and then they had an organic face turn. Right. And we're going to talk a little bit about Kofi later. Yes, that. Uh, the next week, uh, August 19th, Raw in St. Paul. Uh, there's a note here from Meltzer. The show was largely a Paul Heyman show. You know, of course, um, we're probably going to talk about Paul Heyman a little bit later. Mm. But at the same time, how different is it working for the two different shows, two different writing staffs? Just a few months before, they hired Bischoff to run one, supposedly, and Paul Heyman to run the other, supposedly. But you still have the separate writing staffs. What is it like going to Raw and then going to SmackDown? And then is there a lot of cohesion between those two visions? Uh, there's, there's really no difference. Uh, no difference at all. They were, uh, you know, everyone. And they can all leak to the internet or they can all say what they want to say they were they were all writing for one person that was vince they were all writing to keep their job that's all 
Uh, and you know, that may give me a little bit of heat, but that's the truth. Uh, I can't that's pretty commonly thought by most fans though, yeah. is that, you know, you can say, Oh, like Bruce, Bruce is, is this, or Bruce is that Bruce was doing the job he was hired to do, which is say Vince, get Vince McMahon to say, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well, or, or no, no, not even that. This is my opinion. I don't even think he was, you know, he was hired to get Vince to say, yeah, he was hired to say, yes, Vince, that's a good job. You know, uh, he was hired to, to offer his ideas and not, not just him. They all offer their ideas. But in the end of the day, whatever Vince says, they say, yeah, that was good. Yes, that's right. And uh, I can't fault them for that because there aren't very many jobs in the world same with wrestlers, but there aren't very many jobs in the world that call for booking or bookers or uh, writers for professional wrestling shows. Right. So they got to keep their jobs. I mean, where else are they going to go? You know, like, there's not, and and we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about that because things are quickly changing as that in that way as well. Um, the revival again, the new day when Orton showed up and gave E and RKO for the DQ, I guess, uh, you lost by DQ. Uh, most of the match of course was during a commercial break. Yeah. It was a very short match. If I remember right. Uh, you guys beat down E and woods until Kingston ran in. Um, he took, he took you guys out, but Orton gave him an RKO. It's noted here <laughs> yeah. that every, Everybody in the crowd cheered the RKO. You know, Randy, you know, it's a no-win situation at this point for Randy because they love that RKO, but he's also the most evil person in the company. Yeah, so that 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 particular moment, um, Kofi was supposed to run down and he was gonna fight us, boom, 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 boom. And the numbers not not supposed to. Randy wanted Kofi to fight the three of us off, boom, boom, boom. And then the three of us, the numbers game catch up, and then it's the the super RKO. That's what he fought for. Uh and at that time, um, I, rumors are going around that Vince isn't feeling well. Uh, Vince is sick. Uh, Vince is uh, not the greatest health in the world. So he hasn't been at, he, he's not at, t- at television. Uh, there was a long stretch of time where he wasn't at television right, for a very long time. Yeah, uh, quite a few. And so they were having to communicate with Vince through text or through calling or whatever. And so they, you know, they gave us the plans and they said, uh, you know, Kofi will come in and he'll bump around, he'll bump around the revival and get them out of the ring. And then out of nowhere, finally, Randy will hit the RKO and Randy tried to fight for it. He said, no, 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 they're equals to me. And the way we're going to get them over is to portray them as equals to me. So what we need to do is have Kofi come in as a valiant baby face and fight all three of us off. Boom, 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 boom. boom. And then out of nowhere, finally, a numbers game catches up and we catch him out of nowhere with the, the triple team move. And they sent it to Vince. He said no, uh, because he wasn't a fan of ours. And Randy kept fighting for it. And then finally, Randy came to us. He said, look, Vince really wants me to just cut him off. He said, "Uh, as long as we're together again this week and the following week, that's our biggest fight. So, you know, he stopped fighting for that one moment. Man, uh, that must have been really frustrating to have to communicate with uh, Vince like that over text and calling and although i guess you can't sneeze by text so that probably works out <laughs> yeah it was probably less frustrating actually through text because you'd have to deal with them face to face so but that's not the end of the segment because the revival assisted on an rko he does not call it a super rko put it over guy mm-hmm. uh then orton made kingston watch while uh you dawson held woods you guys did your move you guys mm. did that thing you started very early on we talked about last week where you kind of like just trap the legs and mm. then Dash goes to the top rope. Uh, Meltzer, with the best review ever of the revival, says this was a good segment. Dude, so that moment, that's the moment Randy was teaching us main event style. You know, there's a difference between being great wrestler, having great matches, and being a main event wrestler and wrestling main event style. And that is the exact moment that he taught us, even though it wasn't a match, that was the moment he taught us how to be a main event wrestler. Because we, 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 you know, everything you just laid out, we did. We did the deal where we got bumped around and then he RKO'd him. And then he, I remember now that he had, Randy had politicked a little bit to get us back in to hit the, the triple team move because he told us the more that we were together and the more that we hit the move, the more people would associate us with each other. 
which one has taught me a, a lot about tag team wrestling. Me and Dan need to be seen together as much as possible because we're seen as a unit. When we were with the Pinnacle, I tried to explain that to Max, but he would never listen. Uh, and uh, so, but but at this moment, he wanted to get the move in because he wanted us to be associated with each other. And then the stomping part, so beautiful. I I, I beg people to go back and watch that. That's that 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 moment. If you watch it on television, it doesn't seem like as long as it really is because the camera cuts and how Randy, um, how Randy held uh, 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 Kofi and how he was delivering his message to Kofi and making him watch his best friend, you know, get the shit kicked out of his knee, and it was almost like someone making. Uh, old yeller's owner watching old yeller as we took him out, you know, and Randy told us, he said, take your time to, to, to cash and I take your time. Don't jump off the ropes prematurely. Stay up there. Let people see you. Let people see Kofi. Let people see uh, Xavier, Xavier, let people see the pain in Xavier's face and let people see the, the, how, how frightened Kofi is for his best friend and let people see how malicious I, Randy, am to Kofi and then let people see how you guys have no soul and you don't care and then jump off. Boom. And anyway, you know, that one, you know, two minute seg taught me so much about wrestling. That's why when I hear people say, Oh, you know, I don't, I don't really talk to the veterans. I question that because if you don't, man, holy shit, you're missing out. A hundred percent. And Something else you guys don't want to miss out on is Blue Chew. Because the nights are getting longer, but the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff. That's right. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Guys, we all know that confidence can take you far in life. That's especially true in the bedroom, especially when it's time to step up to the plate. That's where Blue Chew comes in, isn't it, Dax? Ed, babe, are you here? Can you, can you hear her? Yes. I think she's saying, babe, do you enjoy Blue Chew nights or what? Yeah, man, they're great. God dang, that's my girl. <laughs> well, Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready when an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluetooth tablets are also made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. You know, it's time to get off the couch and back to work. If your tool needs to upgrade, head to bluechew.com. So Dax, if you could benefit from extra confidence, and you said, man, those extra confidence nights are great. When it's time to reform, chew it and do it. Have better sex. And uh, Dax, we got a special deal for just our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code DAX at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code DAX, to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Well, that that was the easiest one, wasn't it? That was the easiest one, but confidence is key, Matt. Like, uh, speaks out about mental health. Confidence is key. And whether you need it or not, uh, just having it there with you makes you a little bit better. The other night, we uh, we sent Finley with her uh, papui, as we talk, call her and call him in Greek. Uh -huh. That's her granddad. And me and Maria went on a date night, and it worked, right, babe? Oh my God, yeah, it worked. So uh, if I can please this uh, beautiful Greek goddess, you guys can too. Well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, not the Greek goddess, you can't. You can find your own Greek goddess. For the love of God, leave mine alone. I don't think she understands how uh, ugly I really am. You know, I, I, I we were talking on the phone today, and you were saying you're going to a Greek, uh, a Greek church today. Oh for my your God, wife's dude. family, and I'm so. <laughs> 
I'm so fat. The only thing I could think of was like, man, Greek food's great. I love oh, Greek food so, so much. So let me tell you about that real quick. And then we'll get big. You know, oh, yeah, we're good. Uh, so we went to church and we went to the Greek church today and I wore my, uh, my moist socks that have moist written across it. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I hope God thinks it's a funny joke because the socks say moist. Anyway, we went to this Greek church. I've only been in Greek church one time. I'm a, I'm a Southern Baptist, uh, Pentecostal free will sub to Southern Baptist. So I see all the people running up and down the uh, aisles and talking in tongues and we uh, we like to get a little crazy in our church, but uh, I went to this church with Maria and uh, Finley, and uh, it was an experience uh, completely different than what I'm used to. But the thing I was waiting for the most was afterwards, whenever we were going to have all the Greek food. They called it they called it coffee time before the church started. Me and Maria and Finley walked into the uh, well, and I don't know what they call it, but we call it fellowship hall, and it smelled so great. They had all this bread and all this uh, this, this this these these salad things and and all this the meatballs and shit like that cooking. And I was like, I can't wait to get in here and eat. And as soon as the the thing is over, Maria says, I'm leaving. We're done. We're out of here. And I'm oh. like, what is that? The best part is food, and you're not gonna oh let me have God. food. Oh so God. uh yeah, we didn't even get any of the Greek food, but I will say her father's Spanakopita is top notch. What is the name of this? Uh, oh, Spanakopita. I bet it is. Mm. Uh, what is the name of this tequila again we're drinking? Because I'm pouring my second glass, which is probably oh, I'll come with a great you. idea. Classe Azul. Well, I'm going to blame Classe Azul for the second half of this podcast. Um, <laughs> and uh, if, if uh, uh, Classe well, Azul... Says- it says, uh, do not drink alcoholic beverages during pregnancy. Uh, so as long as you're not pregnant, I think you're fine to, to have another glass. It doesn't say podcasting. There's right. not one thing on there that says podcasting, but it probably should. Uh, and on the, uh, um, there's that bell. He's, he's getting that sound, by the way, just by dinging the top of the ornate vase at the very uh, reasonably priced $190 bottle of tequila cost, uh, <laughs> it has. So uh, on August 20th, uh, it's still going on, you know. Uh, you guys kind of get into it with the new day. Um, Orton and Kingston get into it. By the way, I don't think we mentioned this is when Kingston is the world champion. Um, uh, the revival comes out uh, during the uh, Orton Kingston segment, uh, slightly selling the beating Kingston gave them earlier in the show from Meltzer. The revival challenged E and Woods to a tag team title match. But heavy machinery came out. This led to a match. I always thought Tucker was pretty good, um, and I mm-hmm. like I like uh, Otis as, as an act for sure. For sure, um, you know, um, you guys get the win over heavy machinery. Uh, it says here you gave that uh, Dash gave him a Oklahoma side roll. That sounds like some Denny Brown stuff for the pin at six minutes and six seconds. Uh, but something else was going on in wrestling in the world. In the world of wrestling, tequila. Damn it. Um, <laughs> There was an announcement made by one Triple H that NXT was moving to Wednesdays mm. because AEW was a thing. We had double or nothing. We're right, right about right around the corner from All Out. Uh, you were talking earlier about you know there's not that many options for people, but suddenly now there's an option, and it's not like any other option we've ever seen in our lifetime. It's a guy who's committed to wrestling with a lot of money a TV deal, and a roster that largely kind of self-promoted their way into significance. How much were you thinking about AEW at this point when you're like, oh, man, I'm tired of this? So can I be up front and honest with you Absolutely. like I have been the last few episodes? Well, you know, why stop now? Really? I can't get in trouble for this now. I don't think maybe we should run this by our gimmick attorney, Michael Dawkins. Yeah, um, maybe not him. We'll see. <laughs> Someone else. Uh, but when we asked for our release – we had kind of heard that there was going to be a competition. We had kind of heard there was going to be a new show coming up soon. And um, there wasn't, you know, 100% talks, 100% sure talks, but we had heard that it might be something. And so uh, we had been talking to some of the executive vice presidents at the time and they had expressed interest in wanting to have us. They were talking to us and speaking to us as friends, nothing else, you know, as, uh, as, as peers, 
nothing else. We didn't Fellow talk about wrestlers. Yes. We didn't talk about contract stuff. We didn't talk about dates. Nothing but like Cody that. Rhodes did tweet like, you know, before that one day, the revival will face the young Brooks and the world will rejoice. So it was in some people's minds at this point. Uh, well, that was Matt Jackson, actually. Yeah. I, I don't know if he'll tweet that nowadays, but uh, he definitely tweeted it then. Um, but, you know, we were excited about the opportunity of that maybe happening, maybe starting up, but, you know, more, more than that though, well, not, maybe not more than that, but, but along with that, we we're excited for the opportunity to, to travel the world, go to Japan, work the Indies, make a name for ourselves again. And, um, so with the, uh, the, the, the looming horizon of AEW was very, 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 very exciting for us, but also, uh, if we ever got out of our contracts, it was exciting to be able to have this uh, full set restart for the revival. And we were super excited uh, for that because one, we had already got all of our trademarks uh, in order where we could be called the revival and we could use shatter machine and we could use no flips, no fist. Um, so, uh, you know, we were, we were, the future was looking good for us at the time. And things do have a funny way of working out, you know, uh, 826 Raw, August 26th. Uh, there's a tag team gauntlet. Um, what are your general feelings on tag team gauntlets? My Thanks. God. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you see the, the facial expression. That's it. Why? Yeah. What? How does it make sense? How does it make sense at all? Unless you build a really, they built, they did one with Kofi earlier that year mm. uh, or the year before to build him for the title. That's the only one I've seen actually kind of work that way. I, I think, I think gauntlet is good for episodic television you know like it keeps people's interest there's a, a different person coming in you know uh every you know whenever someone else loses and then i think that's great for episodic television but for wrestling it's kind of hard uh to to get invested in that as a wrestler i guess it's kind of hard to get invested in that unless you're the one guy who's starting at the beginning and maybe going all the way to the end um but you know it's just a shorter version of a one night tournament basically yeah, but it's a one-night tournament where, you know, people aren't announced and, and there's someone in the ring a long time and someone can come into the last second. Like, if you're trying to say, well, this is a tag team turmoil for the championship or something, it doesn't seem like the most even playing field if you're trying to buy into the tournament thing. That's just the tequila and Matt Coon talking. Right, yeah, and I'm not disagreeing with you, but I can understand from a television production point of view why they would want to have it. Man, they could eat up some time, boy. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, they, yeah. They did one this last week. It was good, but it, it was like the entire last hour. August 27th, SmackDown. Man, you, you must not miss having to do these back-to-back -back Raw and SmackDowns, right? So at this time, we were, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, it sucked. I was away from my wife and daughter for as much as we were. But, you know, me and Dan, even though we were uh, – supposed to be raw raw exclusive we were doing both raw and smackdown we were doing all house show loops then we were going right from the house shows to raw doing raw then going right to smackdown and doing smackdown and then we'd come home on wednesday morning stay home wednesday morning uh or get home wednesday afternoon i'm sorry and then thursday we were off all day thursday but then we had to wash repack wash our gear repack uh and then friday we're right back out so it did suck but also we thought maybe this is leading to something maybe this will give us something to sink our teeth into and we can show and prove our worth to vents to the audience and to to you know uh, i want to say our 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 co-workers too but they already had faith in us you know there we had already already gone through a period where we worked with roman and bobby and roman went to events and said no we're putting them over tonight they're winning and uh, we had already worked with the usos who said these guys are incredible we want to continue to work with them so we didn't have anything to prove to our coworkers, but we had to prove something to the audience, obviously, but more importantly, we had to prove it to our boss because he was the one who was going to give us the opportunity to prove it to our audience. And speaking of your boss, there's a note here. I'm getting these notes from the observer. It says, uh, Vince McMahon wasn't in Baton Rouge, as you said earlier, he missed mm -hmm. some dates, but once again, changed a ton <clears throat> of stuff. And we were told of much of this was largely put together by Vince the day of the show. Mm. How much did you notice? How much did it affect you? Last second changes. During this era, we heard about this every yeah. single show. Yeah, dude. Uh, it was 
it, even before this, it was like that. It was last, even when Vince was there, it was last second changing. I think it's because Vince is maybe, I, you know, me and Cash, there was a period where we were talking to Vince or going to his office so much. Michael Hayes kind of uh, would get annoyed with us, but I would just, you know, we would just have uh, back and forth arguments, me and Michael Hayes, because I'm trying to make a living here. Yeah, just put and, him in the claw and push him aside. Yeah, <laughs> like the claw yeah. always works on Michael uh, Hayes. That's just I, a pro tip. I should uh, return the favor from JYD and put the hair cream in his eyeballs. There you go. Um, there you go. All kinds of options. We were always there with Vince because we wanted to to we wanted to make a difference and we wanted to do something. But um, you know, the, it was things were 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 always changing and it was it was very frustrating but it almost got to be the norm where you came into work and you knew okay you're not going to know what you're going to do until 8 p.m or whatever um so yeah it was it was at that time man it was it was um it was completely different than anything we'd ever known before can you give an example of 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 the time that like uh, a last second change maybe impacted you oh uh, well uh We'll talk about one, I guess, at MSG, where it was a huge last second change. Um, but there was a time where it was supposed to be myself and Dan against Chad Gable, or excuse me, I'm messing that all up. It was supposed to be, supposed to be a singles match with me and Chad Gable, and me and Chad Gable had put this whole match together. What we had, you know, as far as the back end stuff and what we were going to do, and it was going to set up for a tag team title match later on with Bobby Roode and Chad Gable against me, myself and Cash, and. Um, and then, dude, I'm not even kidding. Maybe, maybe 30 minutes before showtime, it completely changed to me and Dan against Bobby and Gable for the tag team titles in a, a three seg match where we won the belts. <laughs> it's, it was crazy. Um, you're dealing. You said you went to the office a lot and talked to Vince, and of course, Michael Hayes playing the the long haired, monochromatic suited gatekeeper um what were your conversations with vince like always good man and, you know he always um expressed how much of of a fan he was of our work uh and he always listened to our ideas and we brought him a couple of, of ideas and i wish i could remember this exact one i'm sure dan could much better than i can but we gave him this idea and he, and he thought for a second he said Oh, that's a really good idea. I probably won't use it for you guys, but don't be offended when I do use it for someone else. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I mean, you know, that's not fair. If, if, if you weren't afraid to go talk to Vince, he always had time for you. And we weren't afraid to talk to Vince because he's a human being just like we are. And there's nothing to be scared of, you know, not one thing to be scared of. I, you know, he doesn't put any fear in my heart at all. So we would go talk to him and we would have conversations with him, you know, about whatever growing up in North Carolina or whatever. Um, and we would sometimes ex express our displeasure with how communication is to him because we were, um, uh, we were uh, given our own writers and our own, uh, uh, you know, for our own angles and our own storylines. Right. And I would send in stuff every week, how our, how our characters could be portrayed or what angles we could do. Did you have and, a guy? Did you have like a guy you had a good relationship? Yeah. Or, well, not, not a great relationship, of, but, but we had a guy that was appointed to us and I don't remember his name. I remember he had long brown hair, or like, brown hair to here and he had a little shitty mustache too cool look you know cool guy whatever but um you know again just scared of his own shadow just like every other writer there you know every other producer there, scared of his own shadow worried that he's going to make vince so mad vince is going to fire him on the spot so it did nothing so we would talk to vince and, we, and i'd say hey vince you know i sent all these pitches or i sent all these uh character develop development ideas to our writer or this writer, or I would send it to Michael Hayes all the time or John Laronitis would send it to him all the time. And I said, are you not getting it? He said, I haven't got anything. He said, I'm glad you told me this. I will fix it. It never got fixed, but at least he knew I was trying. Eventually after all this with Randy Orton and the new day, and by the way, these, all these attacks are kind of working on, uh, on, um, Xavier Woods leg. 
pretty mm. much, mm-hmm. you know, it's mm-hmm. you're setting it up already. Uh, New Day versus the Revival at Clash of Champions for the SmackDown titles are is announced in September 16th. Raw show, uh, they kind of. <sighs> You know, this is just one of these things, right? Root and Ziggler were the Raw Championships, or the Raw Champions. And I've never done a podcast that didn't tail off into Bobby Roode praise. Like, everybody seems <laughs> to think this guy is kind of, is just the a great guy behind the scenes and in the ring. Is that your opinion as well? All, all around. Incredible. Incredible human being. Incredible husband. Cr- incredible father. Uh, you know, uh, his work speaks for itself. Like I, you know, I've talked about before, and we will talk about in great detail in the future. I'm sure our matches with him and Gable were, uh, and this is me patting us on the back. So I apologize for any heat I'm going to get, but they were otherworldly. They were incredible to the point where all the producers were hearing about it, right? And they were at, because we were asked to go. This was a time when we were working with Bobby and, and Gable. This was a time when there were a lot of injuries. Uh, for for WWE, and so instead of having a a ten match show or a nine match show, we were having a six match show or a seven match show. And so they would ask me and Cash and Bobby and Gable if we would go thirty minutes. And I, dude, I'm not exaggerating. Thirty minutes, forty five minutes. They would th- that that happened all the time. My, my understanding ask- is that there are there is video of these matches, and I may <laughs> have or may have not. A couple of years ago, seeing one of these matches, it's it's at least thirty minute longer, <laughs> dude. We were we were we were going at it, and uh, when we talk about that, I'll talk about one of their. Uh, we talk about one of the top guys getting really mad at us uh, after he had just praised us because we were stealing the show and made him actually work harder. But that's neither here nor there. But Bobby Man is an, an incredible. Um, you know, obviously he's a great talker. Obviously he looks the part. Obviously he's great in the ring. Um, I just, you know, I think he came at the wrong time. And I think Vince maybe looked at him in the same way that he looked at us as just a great wrestler. Right. Right. And of course, Ziggler in that category as well. But same. Yes. He, but he's, he has figured out how to way, a way to make a great career for himself. A lot of guys, fans don't really get it, but a lot of wrestlers could, should kind of look at the career of Dolph Ziggler and say, that's, what I want. I mean, he's had an amazing career, has he not? Yeah. Well, also Dolph can say, uh, Dolph can say, I pushed for myself and I pushed to be better. And I always pushed to be on the top. But if you, if you look at his career, you can see the points where he finally got a breakthrough and he was like, and, and, and they listened to him and they gave him a bone, but then you can see when they pulled it right out from under him too. You know what I mean? That's the, that's the character of a true man. You know what I mean? Uh, because not only is he good, not only is he a model uh, employee because he'll do exactly what you tell him to, but he will also stand up for himself. And I've seen him stand up for himself and stand up for what he believes in. And uh, sometimes he gets what he wants or gets what he deserves. I'm sorry. Uh, and sometimes he doesn't. But whatever it is, he will do. But he'll fight for whatever he believes in. And Dolph is just, Great. Watch any match with Dolph. I mean, I had I had one of our so one of our best tag team matches ever. Me and Cash's best tag team matches ever with with him and Drew in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I can't remember the exact date, but it's on a Raw, and it was one of our favorite matches. It was we we came in cold. They were the tag team champions. Me and Cash came in cold. Uh, people had no reason to believe in us, but we made we made them believe in us and believe that we were actually going to beat them. I find that very easy to believe because Drew yeah. is kind of the man. Um, <laughs> he's he's pretty great. Uh, in this uh, summit, well, so am I, dude. Don't forget about. Oh, that's that. true. That's true. Thank Absolutely. You. This podcast is about me, not Drew. Of course. Well, Braun Strowman didn't think so because Braun Strowman came out while you guys, the Raw champs and the SmackDown champs, were on the ring. I think uh, the Raw champs kind of took off, and Strowman just beat the hell out of you and didn't sell anything you gave him. That cannot be fun for you. I don't remember that. I remember us being in the ring with Bobby and uh, Dolph. I have a picture of it in my phone of us together. Um, I don't remember Roman. I mean, uh, uh, Braun beating us up, but I do not doubt that because we were tag team champions. We were tag teams. We were five foot ten. We were from North Carolina. Why wouldn't Vince send someone out who's six foot eight, three hundred eighty pounds to beat us up? Well, you know, there's probably a a power slam and a big roar and, uh, you know, it was, you know, uh, so 
the next day, uh, SmackDown taping, uh, New Day open SmackDown beating Orton and Revival in 17 minutes and 29 seconds. Says, good match. Orton was dropping guys on the announcer's table, which he kind of mm-hmm. does every match. Um, Kingston was about to do a dive on the Revival, but Orton stopped him and mm-hmm. gave him a draping DDT. Uh, Kingston was about to be hit with that super RKO, but he saved him. Uh, Kingston then gave both Wilder and Dawson a DT and Woods did an elbow drop from one end of the ring almost all the way to the other. I love that move on to Wilder. Kingston pinned Dawson with trouble in paradise. Uh, yep. What did you think about that match? I love that match, dude. It went two segments on television. We opened SmackDown that night. It was so great. I, I, I loved it. We started off hot. The fans were with us. They finally believed in me and Cash. Obviously, they believed in the other four guys, but they finally believed in me and Cash and had a reason to believe in us. Um, the you know we, we put the heat on Xavier Woods' knee. That was the story through the, throughout this whole thing, throughout this whole angle, because we had done the stomp to Xavier Woods. Uh, we put the heat on him, and he sold it so beautifully. And we, again, I'm putting myself over, and I'm putting Randy over, and I'm putting Cash over. We masterfully broke down his leg, and that's a lot of thing. That's that's the thing that a lot of the wrestlers are afraid to do now is do heat on the leg, is work heat on the leg, because there's really if if you think about it on the surface. There's not a lot you can do to the leg that's very uh, fast paced or entertaining because you ground right. someone. Right. That's when you got to use your brain. That's when you got to use your creativity to figure out how to do it without compromising, compromising the intelligence of the audience. And that's what we did in this match because for one whole segment of television, we worked that knee, gave a couple of hope spots, but we worked that knee and made it compelling and made it nonstop, made it, we made the intent. Uh, purposeful and we made the aggression uh mean something we were so aggressive on the the leg and and, uh again that's a match that i watch back and i say that's where randy taught me to slow down that's where randy taught me to stop for a second you know funny enough in that match though randy had he had me and cash right before that match he had us teach him how to chop he had never chopped before so if you watch that match, you see Randy throwing left hand oh, chops. No. Oh, yeah, great. we had to teach him how to chop, and he was so proud of his chops that night. Uh, if you can watch, if you watch it back, you see him in cash, kind of like giving a half ass smile or a half ass congratulatory um, uh, scream to him because he was chopping. And it was actually making a sound. The new day, and you guys are starting to develop a little, little chemistry in the ring. Mm-hmm. Um, particularly, I noticed you and Xavier Woods. Uh, you guys have these little interchanges in every match and it seems like every time you guys add a little thing to it, um, who, who was your favorite person to work in the ring with out of the new day? Was it Xavier? Oh my God, dude. Um, I mean, they're all so different. That's why they yeah, work, right? That, I, I don't think there's a favorite. They're all so different. Like obviously Kofi is, uh, incredible. Well, they're all incredibly entertaining Kofi's and they're all incredibly athletic. My God, I can't, there is not a weak game in their there's not a weak point in their fucking game. Now that I think about it, not, not any of the three. They can all talk. They, they can, can all, all wrestle. they're all mm-hmm. smart. They're all great athletes. They can wrestle. They love wrestling. Uh, so there's not one that I choose over the other. That, that match, especially me and uh, Xavier did run a little bit. Um, and we had some like uh, exchanges there that were great. But man, uh, all of those guys, all three of them, fucking hell man now that you say that and i think about it they could be some of the (laughs) uh you know you know we talk about bobby heenan being able to do everything and being one of the greatest workers of all time because he could do something in every position these guys never you know they've done actually they have they've done commentary and been great at it so you know maybe they're in that same league as bobby heenan man that's crazy to think about that we we lived in an era with the three of these guys i love this match this match is so good like you said it went 17 and some change um and at the time we didn't you know at the time even now uh a lot of the back end stuff is all these big huge false finishes right boom but bam one two kick one two kick one two kick i remember we called the match and we said you know what i don't think this match calls for a lot of false finishes i think if you watch it back there might have been one or two but there were there weren't very many big false finishes there was heat on the knee so we could get heat on ourselves us and randy and there was a big comeback at the end so the baby faces could get the um 
I could get the adulation from the crowd that they needed. And we got the crowd going and, you know, we had a couple of deals at the end, but uh, other than that, man, it was just a, it was, it was a great fun six man tag uh, that did the job of putting the heat on us, putting the sympathy on them, allowed them portray to them to portray their best friends. And they made the big save. Uh, it, you know, that's beautiful wrestling to me. It really did work. And it did lead uh you with the uh uh the work on the leg to kind of lead you into the story for the championships the smackdown title matches excuse me the smackdown tag titles at clash of champions mm -hmm. in september of 2019 uh really good match you guys hit the shatter machine but you said no 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 we're not going to win this way you could have gotten the pin, even Corey Graves on and out. He's like, what is he doing? What are they doing? And instead, you knew you had uh, Big E taken care of. He's not going to interfere. So you, you put on that reverse figure four and made Woods tap out. Explain, mm. first of all, that idea for the match. And second of all, Triple Crown Champs, SmackDown, <laughs> yeah. Raw, and NXT. First ever. So, so the match... Um the match wasn't designed and we didn't design the match either to be the greatest tag match of all time. It was to tell the story, continue to tell that story, you know, to continue to tell new day versus FT RKO. That's what that match was for. And we continued to put the heat on woods leg who sold it magnificently, dude. Like that was so great. The match is not, uh, as far as, uh, you know, it being this entertaining, uh, false finish, heavy, uh, beautiful bombs being dropped match. It wasn't that it was to continue to tell the story between FTRKO and new day. And, uh, we worked the shit out of his leg. And this, again, the reason we made him tap out was because it tied into the story. He had been the weak that not even the weak link, but his knee had been the weak link, the chink in the armor that new day had had for the last couple of weeks because we did the stomp, you know, uh, when we first got together. And so now we were tying the story all together. That's what we were doing there. And that's why we decided to make him tap out. We got to the back after we won the belts and we were all proud of the match. All four of us, man, we we're super happy about the match. We come to the back and Vince is there waiting for us off his headsets. And I'm hoping that since he's off his headsets, he's going to tell us that was incredible. That was a great job. That was storytelling, right? So he come to us, he goes to new day and he says, Hey, great job guys. Thank you. I appreciate that. They walk off. He leaves me in cash there. And that's when he says, Everyone tells me that you guys are the next great tag team. Everyone tells me you're the next Arn and Tully. Well, that's your problem. You are the next Arn and Tully. You're just great wrestlers. That's all. And he walks off. And I'm like, this son of a bitch thinks sure. that he just hurt my feelings by saying that. But he didn't. He made my dreams come true by telling me that I'm I'm the next, we're the next uh, Arn and Tolly. Uh, uh, that we're just a great tag team. We're just great wrestlers. Uh, and, you know, he just didn't, he didn't like us. He wasn't enamored with us. Uh, I think it had a lot to do with this accent that I have coming from North Carolina because, you know, he's from North Carolina. His, uh, his real father grew up in North Carolina. He went to East Carolina and he hated that whole culture. And I think that, Maybe they're the accent or maybe just us in general reminded him of that, but he, maybe he just didn't like us period. That's okay too. Maybe he didn't like us for our work. That's okay too, but he didn't like us for some reason. And he made sure to tell us that that day. And, uh, we're with just your, not with your new titles in your hands. with our brand new belts in our hands, you know, on a high. We're the first ever WWE Triple Crown Tag Team Champions, uh, WWE Raw, WWE SmackDown, WWE NXT. No one else had ever done it at the time except for us. And we were so proud of that moment. And he decided to take a shit on us in that moment. And that's the kind of things as a human being, I will never forget uh, how you try to make people feel because the fans were with us. So obviously we didn't hurt your business. Um, we went out there, put our life on the line for you, for your company. 
and coming back to the back with as much endorphins running through our body and you decide to say that to us that's uh one of the things i can't ever forget and we talk about what i'm going to do in the future and now that i think about that and with him back at the helm uh, makes things a little questionable for me man that, that shows what i know i was trying to say that last week nobody even picked up on it you know uh, <laughs> but here we are and there's something we definitely want to say this week and we want to say thank you to our brand new sponsor we'd appreciate if you guys have been thinking about this product, or if you've been waiting on it, you want to know more about it, now's the time to get it, because support for FDR is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. I first heard of Manscaped on these podcasts, and now they are a worldwide name. Their, pod, their products are precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Well done, Manscaped. Uh, <laughs> Manscaped's performance package uh, is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and a free worldwide shipping with the code DAX. That's easy. Just enter DAX. I look today. I'm going to order something soon. 20% off with the code DAX. If my math is correct, 7 million men, that's 14 million balls and so whether you want to be uh, yeah well yeah, i don't know it, it depends my, my dad my dad only has one so who knows dude <laughs> could be wrong <laughs> so you know at least seven million balls like there we least. go but you know whether you want to kind of trim a little bit tidy up or maybe you want to be ftr bald uh isn't that right Dax? well my my whole apparatus right here looks exactly like my down low apparatus too uh yeah so if you want to make sure you're clean shaven like me dude that was i think that was my favorite gift that i received was the the manscape uh package I was so excited when I got it. I'm not even kidding, dude. As soon as I got it, I opened up, ran upstairs, and used it uh, on my on my face first of all to get rid of all this stubble. And I I loved it because I wasn't I didn't have to use a razor. You know what I mean? Like it completely eliminated the use of a razor. I could just do my little deal on my face. But then I was like, you know what? I'm about to jump in the shower. Why not do the little deal on my little deal? And it worked out there too. So. Yeah, always go head to balls. Don't go. <laughs> yeah, don't, yeah. Don't go, don't go balls to head. Dude, and if you do go balls to head, just don't tell anybody. Um, they have all kinds of products. Of course, if you don't know about the uh, Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, you probably should. We all have it. And I personally bought it a while ago. And I know a lot of people have it. Also, check out uh, the Weed Whacker. Um, is uh, waterproof and and provides proprietary skin safe technology which helps reduces nicks snags and tugs in those nose holes uh they also have stuff like the crop preserver which is ball deodorant who couldn't use some ball deodorant and crop revival uh reviver it will change the way you approach your hygiene routine trust me when i say this fellows your balls will thank you and there's also two free gifts that come for performance package 4.0 so you can get all kinds of stuff including the gifts which are a boxers and a travel bag just bring your comfort and boxers to another level. It's time to take care of yourself. So go to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping with code DAX. Uh, get 20% off and free shipping with the code DAX at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code DAX. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Guys, we ask you, of course, try all the products. We're not going to uh, use something we don't believe in. And Dax has told us a little too much about himself. But one of those things is, you know, this is one of those things like you're not supposed to talk about. You know, that you, you use the same lawnmower for all of Dax, not just part of Dax. Dude, it's the same hair uh, that I'm growing from top to bottom, so I don't care. Uh, dude, I also want to say that the, uh, the lawnmower is probably the quietest uh, trimmer I've ever had in my entire life too. So uh, it eliminates any kind of embarrassment you might have if you have any uh, if you have any roommates or anything like that. Um, but yeah, man, it's it's uh, an incredible package, which makes mine an incredible package as well. Yeah, because like if you have like a big old beard, long hair, and then someone hears like a a, a razor, um, you know they're gonna they're gonna wonder what's going on. Um, so you have the tag team match. You're happy with a match. You tell a story. You wrestle well. Mm -hmm. And what you find out is that from the only guy who matters, that whether you wrestle well 
whether you have the titles, whether you have a great match, doesn't really mean much. Man, and then plus when you throw in the fact that you just pretty much said everybody there's job scared. Yeah. Man, it does it it does not I mean, sound does like it, a great place to work, buddy. Does it tell you why, you know, we kind of were asking for our release, why we wanted to get out? Um, you know, it, it does, it was, but it's also that notion I've heard Conrad talk about it a lot. Maybe uh, not uh, kind of growing on what JR says about creative or cash. Like, what kind of person are you? What do you care about? And there was enough cash to make up for that creative, is what no, I'm no, no. Uh, because here's the thing is they that's when they were offering the contracts, right? The new contracts, uh, because the, the new okay. deals that were coming in for their television rights and things like that. And Cash and I were the only two, I don't think there was anyone else, we were the only two that would not take the deals and they just kept upping the money and upping the money. And we said, no, uh, I remember the first option for myself. I don't want to speak for cash. I don't know what he got. Uh, the first option was four fifty. We said, no, uh, eventually it got up to seven fifty, and we said, no, uh, eventually, um, it could have gotten to uh, seven figs and we would have said no, maybe. Um, but it, 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 it was, you know, it was to the point where even the cash wasn't enough for us, you know, and that's saying a lot because I had, a, I had to, I remember the time they offered us the maximum amount of money they offered us. And I had to call my wife and had to say, Hey babe, uh, this is what they offered us this amount of money, uh, the most money I'd ever been offered in my entire life. And, I mean, every, every offer was the most money on the face was, of ludicrous amount of money. And right? It was crazy amount of money. I said, but I think we're going to tell them no. And I was, I wasn't afraid to tell my wife that because she's the greatest person I know. And she's always, you know, on my side. But I was worried because I didn't want her to say, I didn't want her to have to say, okay, that's fine. I wanted to know what she actually thought. And as soon as I told her, she said, look, none of this is worth your happiness. Do whatever you feel is right. And right from there, I went right back into the office and I said, hey, we're not going to take it. And um, it, you know, it is cash and cre or creative. <sighs> But at some point, neither cash nor creative helps with your happiness. Uh, doesn't help with your your uh, mental health. And I needed to be able to come home every week to my wife and daughter and be happy. And none of that was going to do that. Maybe the cash would have helped me for a little bit. You know, it would have it would have given me that comfort for a little bit. But in the long run. You know, I, I don't, I don't think it would have, and then I would have brought it home to her. And then, you know, who knows if in a year, two years later, she would have been sick of that. And she would have left me because I was such a miserable human being. Right. Uh, and I would have been lost, completely lost. Well, maybe if you took those contracts, you wouldn't be drinking such shitty cheap tequila. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm doing okay now as far as tequila goes. <laughs> um, the following Ron Smackdown, you guys weren't on, but you just talked about your contracts and all that and you know, your mood and how you were feeling in the observer on September 30th. It's reported that the WWE has extended Daniel Wheeler's contract for another 10 weeks mm. due to the period he was out of action in 2016 with a broken jaw. How, how, how'd that work for morale uh, there, Dax? Yeah, not too good. Uh, immediately we went and talked to Mark Carano and he said he apologized. Uh, they had to do it. And he promised us, he gave us his word, which for Mark Carano doesn't mean too much, but he gave us his word. It wouldn't happen to me because they, they knew that we wanted, we wanted out and they knew we wanted to be gone. Uh, he said, it would not happen for me as far as my bicep goes when I tore my bicep. He said, that's, that's, a, you know, we're not even worried about that. That's water on the bridge. Uh, Dave, your contract will be up in April cash. Your contract will be up in July, I think is what it was. And uh, then you guys will be completely free. And we said, thank you, Mark. Uh, we have you at your word. We believe you. And we went from there. Uh, was not too happy about it, but we knew that it would at least give us both a couple of months off if we, if we were done in April, right, you know, for right. me. Uh, and then we were waiting for him in July. At least it would give us some time off to, to rest our bodies. 
because 2019 was such a crazy ass year as far as traveling. Or, or you could um, achieve your uh, dream of becoming a two time 24 7 champ. Nah, not going to happen, dude. <laughs> not going to happen. I would have refused to hold that belt. <laughs> um, you're not on Raw and SmackDown a lot now with these with these titles you're the champions and you're definitely not on the promoted debut of uh smackdown on fox we all remember it was a big deal smackdown on fox uh, you know at the staples center all these stars are there and all this stuff going on but you're not on the show how do you guys feel you have the ch titles but what do they mean if you're never on tv right i mean just like you you would think you know and how you kind of suggested there uh it was it was not a good feeling we were the champions we were supposed to um represent smackdown but we're not on the first smackdown on fox um you know and, and fox was the reason that all these new contracts were being offered you know all these 400 500 600 million dollar crazy, contracts. crazy money everywhere billion crazy. dollar contract everything yes. going on crazy money and we hadn't taken it so, you know, in, in thinking that we hadn't taken it, we were thinking to ourselves, okay, well, maybe they're not giving us this opportunity on Fox because we keep refusing any of the new contracts. Um, and around yeah, coming up soon around this time was when we were uh, given us given the uh, packet of our new gimmick, which was a clock and suspenders like a uh, high energy Coco beware and Owen Hart and all this stuff. So, um, we were, why, we didn't, you, why didn't you get a clock like that? Uh, Cash had the clock, uh, right? Well, that uh, he did, but I, but I had the, uh, I had the, uh, skull cap. So that's why I didn't get the clock. You don't want to, you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to over gimmick your gimmick. Yeah. <laughs> Which is uh, what manscaped is for. <laughs> you, you know, if your gimmick needs to be less gimmick code word Dax, go ahead yeah, and hit them up. Um, you know, the rocks there, Steve Austin, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Sting, Undertaker, Bill Goldberg, Kurt Angle, Mick Foley, not revival. Um, just fine. You know, you know, that's fine. Well, you're the tag champs, but the world champion at the time was Kofi mm -hmm. and Kofi made people cry when he mm -hmm. won the title. There was a lot of people who were very happy with Kofi being the champion fans. I'm talking about. Brock Lesnar comes in, beats him in two <clears throat> seconds or what a minute, whatever. And the Kofi thing is over, never to be revisited or redeemed. How did you feel personally? And what was the feeling in the back about Kofi just like getting completely just rolled over like a Braun Strowman and a tag team summit? Uh, I was very, very upset. I remember that I text Kofi. Uh, and I t I actually, as a group text with the three of us or the three of them, the new day and myself and Dan, and I apologized to him and I said, I'm so sorry this happened to you, man. We we're so upset. Uh, I can't believe this is for real, not because of obviously anything with, with Brock, but how much we had worked and how hard he had worked to get to this point, dude, I, you know, especially when we were working with him, uh, with Randy, I saw him outside of Vince's office or go into Vince's office every single week to try to make things better, to try to make his championship run better. He worked so hard to be a great champion. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, maybe they think, Oh man, he was, you know, his championship run wasn't successful because of, you know, whatever it wasn't for lack of trying. Because I saw him every week, man, try his damnedest to make something of nothing. And it, and it broke all of our hearts, you know, the whole locker room. It broke all of our hearts that that's where the championship was being taken. Um, because not anything to do with Brock, but because Kofi had worked so hard. And seeing someone work so hard for so long to get this opportunity taken away from him, what would they do to, do to us, you know? Absolutely. I mean, for fans, it was weird because I don't know if Brock needed the title, but I guess it was a deal for <laughs> Fox. You know, I guess Fox, with that billion dollars, has a say or two. Uh, you guys are, this uh, our FTRKO thing is kind of winding down. Mm. Talk a little bit about, you know, behind the scenes, the only thing we're seeing about FTRK RKO is on social media. Randy, mm -hmm. you, Cash, you guys are really trying to push for this thing, but it doesn't seem like anybody else is interested except you guys. 
uh, Randy was working his ass off, man. He was trying his damnedest to make it something. Uh, every week he fought. And again, like I said, Vince wasn't there. Whether he was sick or whatever, whatever it was, he wasn't there. And Randy was going to the office. Uh, he was talking to Hunter every single week <clears throat> to make sure that this was something, to make sure we kept this up until it was to the point where I think they took him away from us completely. Uh, they, they had to draft him from SmackDown to Raw to get him away from us because he worked so hard and fought so hard for this idea because it was working. You know, the fans were buying into it, but the problem was the fans was buy the fans were buying into it and it wasn't their idea. It wasn't what they had scheduled. It wasn't what they had written down. It wasn't what they had manifested their own brains or in Vince's own brain. Right. It was because it was actually working out of nowhere. It was, it was working organically. And the one thing you can do wrong, especially in the, co in that company at that time is get something to work organically. And, uh, that was, that was the problem, man. He, he fought so hard. Uh, I, re I remember him and Hunter actually kind of getting into a little, I don't want to say spat or an argument, but Hunter was trying to get, get Vince's vision, uh, to Randy and just let it be because that would be the easy way out because Vince is going to fight for what he wants. And Randy finally ca called Vince and said, this is what I want to do. And Vince said, okay, if you feel so strongly about it, let's do it. And he did it with us. Um, so yeah, we were just, you know, we didn't know it at the time, but we were on borrowed time with Randy. Like Hunter liked you guys. Uh, yeah, I think so. But also it was kind of cool, <clears throat> I bet, to have a guy with the stroke that Randy Orton seemed to have in your corner for a change. Well, not even for a change, dude. We had our whole our whole time on the main roster. Bray Wyatt, uh, Roman Reigns, Randy Orton. Uh, you know, even at the time, like you know, guys like Matt Hardy, um, all, all these main event guys we were working with, uh, Bobby Lashley on the on whether it be on house shows or television events, they were fighting for us because they knew there was something there, and uh, it felt good to have that. But after a little while, you were like, ah, oh, shit, it's going to be the same shit where, you know, it's going to fall on deaf ears because in Vince's mind, I think he thinks these guys think they know better than me. No, 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 no. Let's, let's show them. As we said, things are winding down with the great FTRKO. I mean, who could forget the time that, you know, Roman Reigns was beat up by Seth Rollins and the breakup is just as dramatic here. But before it happens, uh, you guys wrestle in San Diego, a joint branded house show, uh, another six man uh, with you and uh, Orton against the New Day uh, with Kingston uh, pinned one of the revival, one of the revival members, just whatever, mm -hmm. uh, with Trouble in Paradise. I think that might be the last time you guys wrestled together. What date was that? That was uh, October 5th. Okay. San Diego. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and then after that, right after that is when we go on this long tour from, uh, for, it, go, it expands from, uh, the, like the third week in, week in October to the third week in November. Yeah. That was like the last, one of the last few times we, we teamed with him. Uh, in, uh, a couple weeks later, we don't care about FTRKO. So let's go ahead and draft, uh, Randy to raw. Let's go ahead to SmackDown goes, uh, the, the revival mm -hmm. and that's it. Um, that's the le legacy of FTR KO. Well, uh, you you got to think about, about the draft. It. Yeah. You got to think about it like this. When you've signed a contract, a billion dollar contract, do you really have to go with the grain? You know what I mean? Do you have to go with what's working or can you just put on a product that fits your narrative and fits what you think is right? And you know, uh, we had me and Dan had no leg to stand on. Randy had fought as hard as he could to make it work and it just didn't work. And, or it, excuse me, it did work. It just didn't work for Vince. So that, that kind of sucked, but you know, we stayed busy after that. You were, you went on tour, uh, <clears throat> shortly after that, but before you did, there's something I want to talk about. Randy Orton, you talked about contracts. Mm. He had a 10 year deal expiring the next year. And he started doing these teases, and one of them was an Instagram 
post where he, he he said it was like I said elite level and and, and that what what a good friend he is he tagged you in that just yeah. to get you involved in all that you Riddick Moss uh, of course Cash and Cody Rhodes and Chris Jericho man that, that's just the ultimate troll move isn't it yeah I have no idea why he tagged Riddick Moss I remember him tagging him uh, no no clue why it's he did random. that on the bus uh, on the tour on the tour he did that on the bus right beside us we were in the very back uh yeah he uh, because he knew his worth and you know he um he's fucking randy orton he can do what he wants man but you guys can't do what you want nope. but sometimes you can because on tour you get a pitch you get a pitch that kind of reunites you with randy orton but you weren't really about it you want to talk about that a little bit i'm not sure if you want to on here uh, yeah. Uh, so this was around November, the November 11th or something. It was, it was, it was close to that. Uh, we were on this long tour. We had been gone for a very long time. I remember in October, we were home between October and November. We were home, me and cash were home three days because the tour had been broken up we had we had gone to like china and saudi and then we did australia we did the uk and things like that ireland the tour had been broken up into two different tours and everyone got <clears throat> excuse me everyone had gotten to do half of a tour so like for example half of the roster did the first half and they brought in a whole new roster for the second half except for a couple of guys like um roman uh, who had just signed a, one of the new contracts, making a ton of money. Uh, I think Seth as well, maybe. Uh, but other than that, me and Dan were the only ones who were on the whole tour. And <clears throat> they wanted us after the tour was finally over. And we were supposed to, well, I think we were set to go to SMAT, or excuse me, NXT as well, which was on a Wednesday. Uh, they wanted us to go to Raw. We had, like you said, we had been drafted to SmackDown. They wanted us to go to Raw. And we were called by travel, the WWE travel services to tell us that, that we were needed for raw and we lost it. We said, absolutely not. We had been on the road at the time for 17 straight days. Uh, and like I said, three days home for a month and a half or whatever it was. And we said, no, we're not going, or excuse me, I think we said, well, what are we doing? And they said, well, right now the creative is you guys are going to come in and attack Randy, which is crazy because ta uh, travel is telling us this, telling us this, you guys are going to attack Randy. <laughs> the the booker then, over at travel. Yeah. Is telling you, right. You're going to attack Randy and then NXT is going to come in and jump you guys. Uh, you know, and, and, and beat you down. And we said, no, absolutely not. We're not coming in to do that. And they said, well, well, they've, they've got you scheduled. They need you. I said, well, we're, we're not doing that. We're not going to do that. Uh, have Heyman who was booking at the time SmackDown, have him call us and tell us that. And so Paul Heyman called us. We were in a hotel room and Paul Heyman calls us. And he said, Hey guys, uh, I hear there's some problems with you guys. Uh, not wanting to come to raw. And we said, absolutely. This is our deal. We haven't been home for this long. Uh, we're SmackDown guys. We just got to go to NXT this day. Um, why do we need to be there? Well, we need to do this. You're very vital, a vital part of this, this angle. And we said, well, what is it? Well, we're going to have you finally break up the, the, the deal with Randy. You're going to beat him up. And I said, well, what's going to happen after that? You know, which we didn't want to do that anyway. Uh, and the, well, then NXT is going to invade the ring and you guys are going to get the shit cut by NXT, which is going to set up for stuff, stuff later. And I said, no, nah, we're, we're not doing that. I'm sorry. And uh, I said, I said, Paul, we were told by travel that we had creative for raw. I said, we're expecting to go home and say, I'm going to see my wife and my daughter. And we're told by travel. He said, hang on one second. <laughs> and he had the phone right up to his mouth because Paul thinks he's this, this incredible worker. Like, uh, as far as, I mean, he's a great carny. Let's just put it like that. And he says, Hey Vince. Yeah. It's the revival. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah, they were told by travel. Can you believe that, Vince? Yeah, Vince can't believe that either. He can't believe you guys were told by travel uh, it, what your creative was. And he said, Vince, what do you think? Do you think that's, you know, it was it was such a carny thing to do. And so 
<laughs> we said, Paul, we're absolutely not going to be there. We can't do that. Uh, you know, I'm going to go home to see my family. And he says, hang on one second. Vince, they said they, they, said they can't. They want to go see their family. Yeah, I think they should too. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. All right, guys. So I'm going to talk to Vince a little bit more, but we think we've got you off of that role. Okay? And it's like, man, we know you're not talking to Vince. Oh we know he's not there. So it was, uh, that was just some of the stuff we had to deal with at the time, which is uh, whatever. I mean, I don't fault Paul for okay. that. You know what I mean? I don't okay. fault him for that. I don't hold any, <laughs> I don't hold any hard feelings to Paul for that because I think I feel he was a fan of ours, but I think he was also doing what his job entailed him right. to do. But also it's like, and you, you, you can just straight up with us. You can be honest with us. Yeah, that's true. Well, guys, that brings us to the close of this part of the show. Of course, we're going to talk about the match of the week. And I got to tell you what happened to your tweet, Dax. I'm not sure if you saw. But before we do, we have another new sponsor. I don't know if you can see behind me, but I have myself a replica belt. I love some replica belt. And if you've ever dreamt of being in the main event, well, now you can. Introducing Main Event Belts, a championship belt-making company that designs and makes custom belts to the same specifications you see in the top promotions. Main Event, main event Belts have made, have made belts for Harley Race, Jim Cornette, Jake Roberts, The Young Bucks, DDP, Vader. I've seen that Vader belt. It's awesome. Jerry Lawler and more. They have worked with many independent promotions around the world, who are looking for quality at an affordable price. If you're a promoter and you're a professional looking championship belt, then look no further than main event belts. Guys, I love a replica belt and they do a great job. Do you want your replica to be more like the real belts you see in the top promotions? Then have us replace the plastic strap with real leather. They'll read leather it for you. Main event belts, leather crafters can do this. Want to make your belt sparkle like they do in the ring? Then main event belts can replace the plastic stones on your replica with Swarovski's and Cubic Zirconia's just like they use on TV. A real championship belt can be used for any occasion, work event, wedding, school, or celebration. We're talking about custom, guys. So it's time to make your main event dreams come to life. Contact maineventbelts at gmail.com. You know, get your order going because it's probably a little more reasonable than you think or go to www.maineventbelts.com. They ship worldwide and right now, we can help offer a real championship belt from main event belts from only $9.99. But with the promo card code FTR10, you can get 10% off of your first order. Where are you at on replica belts there, Dax? So uh, I don't have a lot of re replica belts, but uh, I will say that they call it seven star FTR for a reason. I might need to talk to main event belts because uh, there's a Raw, a SmackDown, NXT, AEW, AAA, IWGP, uh, and Ring of Honor tag team belts I need to get made for myself because uh, I've got the downstairs basement getting fixed just for us for a podcast. And uh, maybe I need to decorate it a little bit. I can't wait to see that. And, you know, I think... I'm never drinking any other kind of tequila ever again. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to edit out all as many slurs and stammers and stutters as I had. Hell yeah. Uh, but love it. It's fantastic. I Keep it two, in. <laughs> I had two heavy pours of, of this amazing uh, tequila. Uh, Dax, we, you tweeted something literally an hour before the show mm -hmm. about, hey, um, we're going to do a non-wrestling question of the week. And guys, uh, sponsors out there, we're going to have sponsorship opportunities for all of our segments. 370 replies, Dax. Wow. Three, In an hour. It, it, well, it, we've recorded for a couple, but still, dude, that's a lot of replies. Like, people really want to hear. So I had to go through it, and we had some people that we know who ask questions. But mm -hmm. I want to give it to a fan, and this guy's definitely a fan. He goes by Big Beard Booty Daddy on Twitter. Uh, and here's his question for you, Dax. And of course, he used the hashtag FTR with Dax uh, okay. on Twitter. If you could have dinner with any three people, living or dead, who would they be? With the caveat that one is an actor, one musician, and one athlete. Oh my God, man! Oof. Um, I would say an actor would probably be Robert De Niro uh, because of all the different uh, uh, roles that he's played and the ranges a, that he's give played. Give a favorite, De Niro? Oh, my God, man. 
Um, like, of course, you can say Meet the Parents for comedy or one right. of the Scorsese movies, but you know, Goodfellas is hard to beat. You know, Goodfellas is incredible. Uh, man, uh, Cape Fear. Oh, oh man. yeah, maybe Cape Fear. Uh, you, like you know Mick Foley's reference of Cape Fear about baby faces and heels. Do you know about that? Mm -mm. So he says the moment where Nick Nolte hires the guys to beat up De Niro, mm -hmm. and then De Niro beats him up. Nolte's hiding behind the the um, the trash can, and he and uh, De Niro goes, "Come out, come out, wherever you are." And right there, it switched, it flipped. The baby face and heel flipped right there. Yeah, the justifiable Dude, heel. Ah, uh, that's so beautiful because I think, and obviously I'm gonna tie it back to wrestling, but Bretton Austin, WrestleMania 13, the moment they flipped, in my opinion, is when Bret puts the the, puts the uh the chair on austin's leg he climbs to the top and austin takes the chair off his leg and then hits brett while he's on the top rope of the chair right. that's when they flip the fans right. freak out but uh yeah robert and Niro probably as far as that goes musician oh my god uh, i think a lot of people probably will snub their nose at this idea but i'll explain to it why i think I think I would have to say Garth Brooks. Uh, one, his catalog of music is incredible. The Dance is my favorite song of all time. It's a song about life. Uh, but I would love to ask him how he marketed himself. Right. And, ha and how, he changed, hell, right? how yeah. he changed the whole perception of country music and made it the top selling music genre at the time. Uh, and and figure out where his mind was because one, he's a great, like, don't let the, uh, you know, I'm a huge country music fan, but don't let that genre fool you. He is an incredible songwriter, dude. If you watch, if you look at the amount of songs that he wrote for his own albums, albums and listen to them and saw what were hits, he's an incredible songwriter, but he's a great storyteller and I want to figure out how he marketed himself to be the complete king of country, the king of music, because of music. aside from the Beatles, he's the biggest selling uh, and, artist of all time. And they go back and forth. Yes. You know, like they keep changing one. positions. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I respect that. Biggest selling solo artist of all time. How he did that. I would love to figure out um, athlete, even though go ahead. Sorry. Includes wrestlers. Yes. Athlete. I mean, I've talked to him, you know, a few times, but it still would be in an intimate setting with Bret Hart. N n nobody become. I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan. I, I, I love Michael Jordan from obviously his Chicago Bulls run. I love him from his Washington Wizards run. Um, uh, I'm a huge Allen Iverson fan, uh, but uh, above every other athlete, it would be Brett. I would love to have him have him alone. God, this sounds so creepy. Oh my God. <laughs> oh Jesus, Brett. I'm I can, sorry. I can play some music. Yeah. I'm like, uh, the, 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 uh, silence of the lambs guy, but <laughs> have, have him alone in an intimate setting where I could ask him every question that I wanted to ask him that would be my, oh, I mean, that, that's above everybody, you know, uh, above everybody in that category. And, and then, the last you know, question you'll ask him is, would you please put the lotion in the basket? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 if you mind. Uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, I'll just do this quick. Charlie Chaplin, Magic Johnson, and mm. um, Paul McCartney. That's Huge pretty, Magic Johnson fan, too. Uh, to, uh, Paul McCartney as well. Great, great musician. Um, also someone who stood up for himself. That, that's another thing with, with Garth, too, with Paul McCartney. He stood up for himself for a very long time with, with Apple Music. But even Garth with now, he has stood up for himself and what he believes in because he doesn't, doesn't think Apple Music uh, uh, pays the right amount of money to the artists. Whether they do or they don't, I don't know. But he believes that. That's what he believes. And I would love to figure out why he believes that and what makes him tick because he's so self preservative self his, yeah, his, his self preservation works. is incredible yeah. so yeah it, those would be my three so there's our question every week we're going to ask on twitter for a new question thank you to big beard so matt Three. real quick yeah there's one question that i saw that i want to ask uh, oh yeah to let's do two let's kick yes. off with two i'm sorry but this is from at uh chef underscore spike 90 uh, hashtag FTR with Dax. He says, I meant I'm really struggling with anxiety attacks at the moment. 
It's more of an of a anxiety about having anxiety sort of thing. How did you manage your anxiety and how did you prevent uh, attacks from happening if you have them? So <clears throat> his name is Spike Knock on Twitter. Uh, so I had an anxiety attack while I was in Japan. The worst one I've had since it happened in 2021. And I was completely lost. Uh, I was by myself in a different country in a room by myself. And I was, I was, I was just, I was just, I was just lost and had no idea what to do. I stayed awake all night and my anxiety stems from sleep. My anxiety also stems from having anxiety as well. I'm, I'm with you right there. Anxiety um, is the fear of anxiety often. Absolutely. And that, that's what it was for me. And I was scared to death. Uh, thankfully, I'm able to have the woman of my dreams and I could call her and say, babe, please help me. And I called her multiple times and she talked me through it and helped me out. Um, but what I would say is try to continue to tell yourself, this is anxiety talking. This isn't the norm. This isn't what your normal is. This is anxiety talking. Also know that it's happening all across the globe to everybody. Also know that it's okay to be, to be vulnerable and it's okay to take medication. All right. And like, I'm a big advocate of advocate of medication. Medication was made for people like you and me. Okay. It was put there for a reason. It was made for a reason. It gets a bad rep because that's the easy news story. That's the easy news story to say, oh, they took four Klonopin and then drank a whole bottle of tequila. That's the easy story. But the good story isn't, oh, well, he took one Klonopin, one milligram of Klonopin, and he was great. No one wants to hear that. No one wants to report that. So it's okay to go to the doctor and it's okay to say, I have this problem and it's okay to say, I need help. And it's okay to have that help in the form of medication and you take your medication. All right. And that that's, um, uh, therapy and medication and what I perceive the man above to be God has helped me so much. Uh, and I would implore anybody who's in the same boat as me to find a medication that works for you as well as Klonopin worked for me uh, because Klonopin allowed me to, uh, when I was having anxiety attacks, it allowed me to calm down for a second, take a step back, reassess everything and realize that this is anxiety. And then I was able to wean myself off of Klonopin and now I just take uh, Zoloft and Zoloft helps me manage every single day. It helps me manage and understand that patience and peace of mind is a great thing to have. Um, I, I think just knowing that you're not alone, dude, uh, will hopefully help you out. Um, it happens to me. It happens to all of us. And I hope you get better. And you mm -hmm. have every right to get the help you need. And if you have friends in your life that don't understand it, get other friends because you definitely have a friend in your life who can understand. Please talk to somebody on the phone <laughs> during it because that can help a lot. It's real, buddy. And uh, mm -hmm. we're here for you too. Yeah. And like uh, for me, it's specifically that night, um, because when it first happened in 2021, I had no clue what anxiety was. I didn't know what was going on. Right. At this point, I did. I knew what it was. And when I finally started to just take a step back, and this was like six in the morning, man, I finally started to take a step back and I said, okay, let's chalk this day up, excuse me, this night up to a loss. Tonight's a loss. This is a new day and it's, a, it's, it's progress over perfection. Try to progress to being better than you were last night. And it might not happen. And if it doesn't happen and you're not better than you were last night, that's okay too. Just know it will be better and you will work to get better. It takes practice. <clears throat> That's mm -hmm. the other thing. You can say, oh, I tried that. It didn't work. But it takes practice <clears throat> to retrain your brain yep. to not freak out when, yes. at least for me, <clears throat> what happens is physical things happen. Like mentally, I'm good. <clears throat> but physically, enough happens. My palms sweat. My hands shake. I get lightheaded. My, my chest beats. So... You know, it takes practice to kind of it go, does. guys, it's just my fucking brain fucking me up. Absolutely. I, you know, so <clears throat> January 4th was Wrestle Kingdom. That's when I had the anxiety attack. 
just today. I'm not kidding you. Right before this podcast start, I told my wife, I said, this is the first day that I don't feel worried about going to sleep or I don't feel anxious because it took time. It took practice, just like you said. Well, that's great to hear, dude. Uh, this show, I guess we have a two hour podcast now. I guess we can get you. I guess so. Uh, Sorry guys, but people like it. People are enjoying it. I want you, before we talk about the match of the week, guys, make sure to check out our YouTube. We're going to be putting up sneak peeks of the show. A lot of the show, um, is going to be on YouTube as well. Of course, listen every week on your podcast provider. Dax, I was thinking if we get up to, let's say 25,000 subscribers, we do like a little bonus YouTube uh, deal. How's that sound to you? Oh, absolutely. I'll do it anytime, dude. Yeah. We'll do like a, uh, uh, maybe like people want to hear you talk about Bret Hart or maybe <laughs> express. We'll do some kind of retro watch along on YouTube. Once we get up to 25,000 subscribers, uh, Dax, speaking of great matches, what is the Dax Harwood match of the week? Uh, I'm looking up the date right now, and it's 2000. It, it, yep, exactly. December the 16th, 2013. It's from Raw. Uh, since we talked about Randy today, I thought we would blow out a Randy match. Um, it's Randy Orton versus Daniel Bryan. Incredible match. If I'm not mistaken, it went three segments throughout the whole <clears throat> throughout the end of the show right. and uh it's such a beautiful match these two guys try to outsell each other and the <laughs> the strikes are incredible the 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 pacing is incredible also at the beginning daniel bryan who is the baby face the perennial baby face at the time is is doing something that no other baby face really has done since i've watched ricky morton and robert gibson do it he's working the leg in his quote unquote, which is not a real thing. It's not even a real fucking thing. Shine. Shine is not a real thing. Whenever you hear something, you know, you, you guys don't hear it, but the wrestler says, I got to get my, sh- my, this is part of my shine. Shine's not real. It's, it's not it's real. Part it's, of the, it, what they mean is part of the match where they <clears throat> get to look good, right? It's from a, it's from a heel at one time, a long time ago saying, all right, kid, I'm going to shine you up at this point and then I'm going to cut you off. And they, someone kept saying that and they kept saying that and they kept saying that and said, oh, well, during my shine, I got to hit these moves. No, that's not the case. Uh, we'll dive into uh, uh, you know psychology one day, but this 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 quote unquote shine where Randy is shining Daniel up and Daniel is shining himself up as well. He's working the leg, which is so beautiful, and it's sold throughout the whole match by Randy. Uh, the false finishes are great. The storytelling is great. They do something that you don't see very often nowadays. And like I said earlier, they out they try to outsell each other. Who can sell the most? And that's when you got a great match, dude. That match is beautiful. So so, so December the sixteenth, two thousand thirteen, Raw. Well, check it out, guys. That's Dax's match of the week. And, man, I tell you, it's four four episodes in. It seems like we just started, but it also seems like we've been doing this for years. We got, <laughs> you know, like we got like a great conversation. We're drinking tequila. We're picking matches. We're talking about shit we shouldn't talk about. Uh, people hate us. People like us. Uh, we have a great group of listeners. Sounds like we have a podcast, Dax. If you're not controversial, you're not worth remembering. And I think for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons, we are controversial because we speak our mind and we tell people uh, what needs to be told. I'm very proud of this podcast. I'm very proud of uh, how enlightening it is, but I'm also proud of uh, the truths that we tell. And I'm proud that we've never backed down from anything or anybody. And I'm proud of the podcast we have, too. And we're proud of y'all for listening. Thank you. Keep listening with us. It's only going to get better. We might have some cool stuff in the future. Be part of it because we want to we want you to be part of it. And we'll see you next week on FTR with Dax Harwood.
told you just a day. Respect the past and what it say. You better move.